So I started researching Chernobyl just because I was generally interested in it. And after a couple of weeks of just falling in love with these stories that were so heartbreaking and so shocking, I went to Carolyn Strauss, who is uh, an executive producer of Chernobyl along with myself and Jane Featherstone. And she and I went to HBO and we said, here's what we want to do. And HBO said, okay, let's see if you can do it. So uh, what then happens is you do a lot of writing. You do a lot of research and a lot of writing and you try and get to a place where eventually you get networks like HBO and Sky willing to say, we, we will put together the very considerable amount of funds required to, to make the show. But essentially it started because I was fascinated with a simple question. Why did Chernobyl happen? And the truth of that is, in my mind, more shocking than the actual explosion itself. So how do you research something like Chernobyl? You start with pretty simple resources. I think everything can start with an encyclopedia your, of your choice, and then news articles that you find. And then you start to move into uh, books that are summaries. But eventually, what you find is that's not enough. In the case of Chernobyl, there were there was a real challenge. There was two challenges, really, major challenges. One was that it's a story that comes out of the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union, as we know, was not necessarily forthcoming with a lot of facts and information. This was not a society that featured a free flow of information or ideas. The other issue uh, was that because of that restriction, there were a number of accounts that did come out that didn't always agree. So part of the challenge was figuring out which of these accounts felt the most accurate, by and large, I tended to uh, default to accounts that were less dramatic. You'd think that maybe I would want to go for the more dramatic ones, but my instinct was, in telling a story like Chernobyl, you never want to feel like you're helping the drama. The drama is dramatic enough. The tragedy is tragic enough. Uh, but beyond that, I had the benefit of an incredible book by, uh, written by a woman named Svetlana Alexeyevich, who is a, a Nobel Prize winning author called Voices from Chernobyl, and it is a collection of first-person accounts. And I thought that was uh, remarkable, and in many ways just as important, if not more so, than the various governmental reports and books and news articles that laid out the events of Chernobyl and the causes and the science. Her book really explained the human cost and the human aspect to this, which is what I was fascinated by. So the combination of those things uh, created an enormous bulk of research that took years to put together uh, as, as well as turn into a show. We did speak to people who were there as liquidators, and of course we did have a lot of first-person accounts. There were some people that we wanted to speak to, um, but they've kind of moved on. And part of doing a show like this is to respect the privacy of people um, who are there who maybe have said all that they want to say. And that's, that's a hard one, I think. Sometimes people think, well, you owe us something more. But my feeling is you don't. They, those people owe us nothing. They've, we owe them, as far as I'm concerned. So we approached all of this with as much humility and sensitivity as we could. But we did have, happily, the benefit of a very substantial uh, amount of first-person accounts. And we also um, spoke a lot with people who just generally had grown up in that time in the Soviet Union, in Ukraine, in Belarus, and just spoke to them about how their lives functioned on a day-to-day -day basis. I had them, a, a number of people, read through the scripts to say, does this feel culturally accurate? Have I made mistakes? What would you suggest would be more true to your experience? So we tried to take all that into account, and I think we were fairly successful. It's probably a better story to tell you that it developed over time in this wonderful process, but the truth is, I had a point of view of how I wanted to do it, and that's how I did it. I always felt that the story needed to be told in a certain way, and that that way was respectful of the audience, respectful enough to say, you all know that this thing blew up. I'm not going to make you wait five episodes for anything to blow up, nor am I going to even make you one episode for something to blow up. It's not about the explosion. I want to show you what it's really about. And I want to tell the story through the lens of people. And these are the three people I want to do it with, and that's how I'm going to go. Now, in between all of that, a million changes occur and things develop and emerge. But the basic point of view of how I wanted to tell the story was there with me from the start. What do I want people to take away from Chernobyl? What I want them to take away more than anything is that if you lie, 
if you are part of a system of lying, if you are someone who agrees with lies that are given to you by your government, by your leaders, by your churches, by your friends, by Facebook, there is a cost attached to this. The truth is always there. Right now, we live in a time where there is essentially a global assault on the truth. And we comfort ourselves with stories because they're comforting. It's hard to say that, for instance, the climate is changing and threatening our existence. It's much easier to say, or is it? It doesn't seem like that way today. Well, you can do that for a while, but eventually the truth catches up. Eventually it does. We cannot hide from it. And Chernobyl to me is a story about what happens when people put lies above the truth. The truth does not care and it will get you. So I hope that when people are done watching Chernobyl, they have a new understanding of how all of our governments function in a way that is not so far and indifferent from the Soviet Union, which we once thought of as uniquely uh, poor in its relationship to, to the truth. I think now we're starting to see we all have trouble with it. And that to me is a lesson of Chernobyl. I started, I used to be in music. So I was a recording artist back in the early 90s. And we were going to do like a first video ever for that. And I had all sorts of high ambitions on who I wanted to do that. And then my record company boss said, hey, you have two grand, figure it out. So I realized I had to do it myself. <clears throat> but it wasn't, you know, utterly out of the blue because I, I've done, you know, I come from photography, I've done a lot of other things, and I, and I figured slightly foolishly that I could, but, but I got into it there. And um, weirdly enough, instantaneously, literally fell in love with it. And I've, I've been doing music for a long time, and pretty much on that shoot day, I realized that this is what I want to do. So I continued making videos for myself, and then friends were asking, and then friends of friends, and then more and more I, I enjoyed that, and that kind of replaced, it didn't replace my love for music, but it replaced another, some other needs and urges. So I, I decided actually, literally, to, to leave music behind and, and continue with directing. A script was lying on my desk one day, uh, as they do. There's a lot of scripts in the, in the world of, of filmmaking, and the thing is that most of them are not very good. Uh, but it, you know, just by the title, I got very intrigued uh, because I knew that would be something that interests me. I like stuff that is that it's that it has darkness and a certain hopelessness and aspects of even nihilism in it and. That got me interested, but then also I'm old enough to, to, to vividly remember when it happened. Um, so there was already sort of a narrative for me to sort of hook on to. Um, so I just jumped over the script and like with all these things, it starts with the script and the script was very, very good. I had just come back from a very similar type of limited series in Eastern Europe, I, actually longer. Um, so it was a bit of a conflict between me and I have a very large family to sort of even allow myself to be interested in something with all the ramifications it has uh, in my life. You know, th that's the, the downside with filmmaking is that it always involves a lot of travel and long travels and all that. Uh, fortunately enough, our, our kids are small enough to still be mobile. And uh, my wife and I spoke, spoke, spoke about it, and, uh, and then we realized we just had to do it. I mean, doing, doing these kind of projects involve a lot of different stages of it. What was very interesting for me, this is the first time I've ever done something that is based on facts. You know, very much, you know, telling a real story. And coming into this, where I ca came from, sort of a fiction lover on a lot of levels, I felt that, like, let the, um, let the drama sort of govern the situation here. Um, and first time upon reading the script, I was talking to Craig, the writer, and I said, oh, this is great, so how much of this is true? And he said, everything. Right there, my mind was blown, because obviously my, my knowledge about the Ch Chernobyl catastrophe was limited to what everybody else knew, but you know, upon reading this script, you understand that it's just a fraction of the magnitude and the tragedy and the in, this incredible event on so many levels. So from going from being a fiction person who wouldn't, 
give a fuck about whether something was true or not. I've now become the opposite. I'm I'm only interested in real, true things. And upon embarking on this, I started reading everything I could ever come over. Uh, Craig had already done a lot of research and actually sort of made a good um, sort of file of stuff that one could look into. So it was a good start. There was a lot of books to read and a lot of films to watch and so on. And then I just continued. I, I couldn't stop. I was so immersed in it and so interested in everything. You know, it becomes more and more personal. You want to read an individual stories. You want to sort of feel what they felt and so on. So I, I, I think I've read everything that there is on the subject, including some quite boring sort of nuclear engineering stuff, but I just had to understand everything. I always feel pressure in doing anything for myself. Uh, the whole, one of the main things in many art forms is to make it as difficult as you possibly can for yourself, you know, and to not take any easy routes and, and not sort of follow some path of least resistance, rather the opposite. The only pressure I ever feel is for myself. Uh, and, uh, you know, it became, for me about you know the truthfulness of course but also sort of the the sort of the individual emotional authenticity of it you know you want it to feel experiential and real rather than as a fictionized or a drama even if it's based on real events for me it's about making it as experiential as ever possible so that you rather than watching it through normal filters of film and drama and that's why i also got increasingly interested in it it's more about Feeling the realness and feeling the authenticity of, of, of the of the of the people we meet, the situations, and all of that. So, so it was very much about finding a path down something very difficult. Try to avoid all you know. Try to avoid you know desperately avoiding any tropes or anything that is sort of. There's a lot of filmmaking in which the references are from films, you know. But I'm not like that at all, and I don't like that. So so it's so there is this sort of constant. Uh, sort of movement towards referring to reality rather than to the world of films in, in, in everything. Again, I st sort of started out in photography, so for me the image is, is very important, not necessarily from an aesthetical point of view, but for, f from how the image makes you feel. And, and uh, I mean, I guess it's just personal taste that I very much like, sort of a, some, some type of raw authenticity, but, but still with a photographic quality to it, I like the image adding a layer of emotions to it, how, how, how this image is made and how we do that. And, and then it becomes into sort of film school stuff which deals with who, who, what is the eye, who's, who's watching and how do we enhance the sense of us participating in this rather than looking at, at it from the outside, but whilst also making beautiful images. So, uh, it's for me, that aspect of filmmaking is something I'm very comfortable with based on where I kind of come from. And I, and I, uh, th that's not something that, that, that particular bit comes very natural to me. And uh, I, I uh, there's very few questions from me. It's just instinctively, I know exactly what I want there. Um, and then I had the, uh, the, the pleasure and the privilege to work with a Swedish DOP that I've that we both have tried to work with each other for many, many years and it never worked out. And then just by some very strange serendipity, it worked out this time. And not only did it work out, it was a, a phenomenal partnership in terms of sensibilities and uh, sort of this sort of Scandinavian, I don't want to say austerity, but there is a, there is a minimalism to some extent in how, how, the, how, how we deal with the photographic language. Yeah, it's a massive question. I'll just take one advice out of many. But I think it, it has to do with idiosyncrasity, you know, to, 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 as a director, as any form of artist, whether you write music or write books or poetry or making film, you have to have a voice that is singularly your own because there is no such thing as an arbitrary quality as a director or, or, or as any artist. Even if you're young enough to not trust your own uh, personal choices, because when you're younger, you tend not to, that's maybe the most important thing ever because whenever I meet students or I meet young filmmakers, the only thing that interests me is a unique voice. Uh, everything else can be taught, you know. And and what you want is that you know from the onset that you that you allow yourself to be free enough to 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 dig where you stand and to use your own references and experiences and and you know 
trust in the way something makes you feel and not about like, oh, this people are probably going to like this, but sort of just go down to your own feelings and be brave and very bold and all of that and take massive, massive risks. That's that's the only thing. I mean, that's one of about a million pieces of advice I can give, but that, that one is a pretty good one, I think. Uh, what is Chernobyl about? Chernobyl is about the... Um, the nuclear accident at the Chernobyl site and uh, how it very nearly made most of Europe uninhabitable without the dramatic intervention of our characters and Emily's character and the heroic sacrifice of uh, several thousand Ukrainians who history, uh, haven't, they don't, we don't really know their names but they, uh, they sacrificed themselves to prevent the disaster from getting worse. So in a nutshell, what would you say? I think that was very well put. Thank you so much. I play Valery Legasov, and he is the, the leading nuclear expert who uh, is assigned to try and figure out how to, um, how, how to prevent this disaster from spiraling out of control. And I play Boris Cherbina, who is... Uh, who is a minister in the government and who gets the job to take care of the accident. And at first, I'm very skeptical about this, this scientist guy. Yeah, because science. Of course, science. I'm like Trump facts. and all those politicians. But, but uh, facts, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, eventually, I see, I learned from the disaster and what's happening there that uh, there, there are certain flaws in our our uh, Soviet political system that has sort of contributed to this catastrophe. And, and we grow, cl grow, uh, grow cl closer to each other and uh, eventually work together in the film. I was approached, they asked me if I wanted to be in it and they said Jared was in it and, and they wanted Emily in it as well. And it was a very, very good script. Sneaky, because I think they sent the script to me and approached me and they said you were in it. Yeah, that's how yeah. they do. Yeah. That's how they do yeah. it. Oh, if he's in it, I'll yeah. be in it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the, the, the scripts were really good. They were really yeah. well written. We only got the first four. We didn't, the, the, didn't get the fifth one. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it was a page turner. Mm. It was really gripping, very exciting. One of those things that you think you know, you knew what the story was, but you really didn't, and you didn't understand the personal journeys and the stories that were involved, or how potentially catastrophically bad it was for pretty much for the whole of Europe. Mm. And I remember, um, I, mean, I was in London at the time when the, the famous cloud starts to drift over. So I had sort of memories of it in that sense. So uh, I was curious to know what had actually happened. And I was also interested in working with Joanne Rank. I wanted mm. to work with him before, but it never happened. And, and uh, He's done a fantastic job. I did, I, I, there was not much to find uh, in, in researching Boris Cherbina. Uh, and I saw that he looked something completely different than me. So I decided I wanted to look, look like Kasigin or Beckett or something instead. So I went another direction there. Uh, the preparation, I, I'm really mostly interested in finding out what's good for the script and what's good for the story more than, than doing, uh, trying to imitate the surface of reality. But I don't know, how did you prepare? I, I, I started, well, interesting enough because... Because that, your character is, is more documented, isn't he? Well, it's, he is, although um, when you start to look online, and they did a pretty good job of, uh, of uh, rubbing him out of the record. Mm -hmm. So there is, there's some photographs, there's, there's some footage of him. Um, I quickly realized that I didn't look anything like him either. And also, the, the function that the character plays in Craig's script was very different to the one that he actually played. So um, um, I, actually it's one of the first times that I've done research on something and realized that a lot of it wasn't useful. So I, I stopped and just concentrated on the script. Um, and there was, there was a lot to concentrate on. Uh, <laughs> We were all happy that you it, concentrated on the yeah, script. It was good. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was helpful. <laughs> it was helpful at some point to concentrate on the script. <laughs> you know, because generally that's what you're going to shoot. You don't shoot your research, you shoot <laughs> the script. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to 
and I said the most challenging part was getting your head around the science. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of words that are related uh, to yeah. science. Yeah. And um, you know, one of the reasons why I became an actor, I don't know about you, was because I was really bad at science. Mm. It, it's a very challenging text, and a, a lot of um, ideas that you have to uh, convey and. Um, and then you do need to figure out what it is. You've obviously got to understand what you're talking about. Um, and that it is a challenge. I, I've got to the same point in the, um, uh, the brief history of time about, you know, the Stephen mm, Hawking thing. Right, yeah. I get to the same point every time and then I just hit a brick wall. I can't get past black holes, uh, mm -hmm. which is really only like the first chapter. Mm. Um, so it is, if your mind isn't geared towards that stuff, it, it, it is difficult, mm. um, but luckily Craig has written it so well that it is understandable even for actors. Actors, even actors can understand the science. <laughs> when if you can get actors to understand it, then I think anyone can understand it. Uh, no, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I've been asked to to say how do you do it, and uh, and I still don't know how to do it. But 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 uh, I've learned to listen. Uh, and that is, I think, really important, to listen to your fellow actors and to take what you do from them rather than from something you rehearsed in front of the mirror at home. Because a scene, a scene, if it's good, it happens between people. It's not solos. Uh, at least I'm not very fond of that kind of acting. So I, I think listening could be a good thing. What do you think? Well, I, I mean, Emily talks about the advice that you gave her on, on the first... Uh, Breaking the ways. Yeah. What was that? It was something about whatever you have planned, uh, whatever you think you're going to do, let it go. Or something, something yeah, along that those lines. Yeah, that sounds good. It I was, it was very I good advice. I hope I said that. You, you did, well, <laughs> she always repeats it, so she thinks you yeah, said it. She, yeah, but that's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that I'm is, happy about that. Yeah. I what thought it was great advice. Yeah, you have to let go. You, you, you can't... Um, the hard thing in, in uh, what I think is the hard thing in cinema, a little different from theater, because theater, you, you are a, a living human being in the same room as the audience, but, but on, on film you're just a two-dimensional flat picture, which means that bringing true life to it is, is much harder. Uh, uh, the audience can't smell you, uh, but it's, 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 it's much harder, which means that, that life, you cannot plan life. And what, what appears on the screen as life is usually not the things, the clever things you, you figured out at home and planned. It's the things that happen in the, in the moment anyway, which means, uh, which is sort of the idea. Uh, I mean, when, when we work, we, we, we don't do the scenes exactly the same in two takes. It's it, because different things happen. He looks at me in a different situation. He looks a little different. His line comes out differently, and then my answer comes out differently. And that's the fun of it, uh, of this job, is, is, is that things you couldn't plan grow in front of the camera and becomes life. Yeah, you have to... See, I would have said, my thing is I, I always want to be prepared when I show up, but um, you have no clue what the other person is going to do. And um, you, you can't block that out. You have to allow what the other person is going to do to change everything that you thought you might do. Mm. So that, because then it's an, it, it, you're capturing the interaction between the people, I would say. Yeah. Berg, 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 Bergman said he was, he was always extremely well prepared so just to, be, to feel the absolute safety to be able to improvise. Uh, now, I mean, he did not let his actors improvise that much, but still. 